Here we go. All right. Um, when you read that I was going to give a presentation, when you decided to come here, you probably built up some expectations. With you, I was talking about uh, yeah, scoring. So what exactly are your expectations? What do you think will be different when you walk out of here than when you get in? Understand that TV, okay. What else? <laughs> okay, understand that TV. There's already two check marks there. Anything else? What was your expectation? What should be different when you talk out and when you give it? Just a better general understanding of the story. Okay, good. How will you measure that? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Anything else? Okay. okay, that's very good. But that's actually because of those discussions, that's why I decided that I could talk about this here. Because that seems to be one of the big mysteries in this whole story. Why does one day you get 700 points and another one where you feel almost the same amount of time gives you much less? So, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is three, two things. Both are abbreviated with three letters, GAP and FTV. I'm going to make most of why they're called like that. First of all, who is this guy standing here in front of you? Uh, most of you, in one way or the other, probably will have touched with my word over the last few years. Uh, I started paragliding in 1992 with a paraglider called the Twist, a two prizer system without any accelerator. It's great. Uh, my first competitions were in California, because I lived there for a while and I had to do it in the Owens Valley uh, with oxygen on my second competition. That was quite exciting. Uh, I won one competition in my life, so that was the Marion Open in 2007. The second was Ralph Benz, so at that time he flew a glider that was much too big for him. So I, uh, I was here in Tucumán in 2007 yeah, with my partner at that time. Uh, there's a badger for the Americans. Uh, yeah, we're not having a bit better on that. Yeah, you know, all week. I did, uh, during the whole week, I never got higher than uh, the launch. All the months. What else are you? I was a member of the Swiss team once for the Europeans in 2010. Those who were there, it was lost around their way for two weeks. And so This was one of the cancelled days. Um, and in 2011, I found out that there had been a rule change decided by CIBL. And as the World Championships were approaching, nobody had taken care of it, nobody had implemented it. So I asked the president at that time, Marcus, uh, who's taking care of that? He said, nobody right now. Do you want to do it? So I did it. And from then on, I was Mr. FS. So FS, the scoring system that yeah, we've been using many years to score competitions all over the world. The last 10 years or so, I, I took care of it. I fixed the box from the original implementation. And I, um, also in 2011, of course, we had this thing where for a while we were supposed to fly over the serial wings because all the class wings were banned. I was a member of the group that developed new rules to come out with the, what we call now the CCC, the Civil Competition Class Flyers. I'm actually the author of the first edition of the uh, specifications for that. Of course, Adrian Thomas then took it on and created this great set of rules that we have now that creates this great flag, flag with five supporting them here. Because I was already writing big documents, I decided to also write big document about how our scoring works, because up to that time it was only implemented in software, but it was not written down anywhere. So I went through the software and took all the information out of it and created the document that we now use. It's now part of section seven in CIBL uh, for scoring for I do fly myself every now and then, uh, and this was my wing a couple of years ago, and you can see the logo. 
that's because uh, at that time, in 2014, the founders of the company called Flight Bank, the band heard of, uh, asked me to run their company for them. So I'm the chairman since then. I've been the general manager of that company. Many of you find the Groningen instruments, they're the same thing, just on the I fly cross country flights, also not only competitions, sometimes I don't really optimize for FBI flights. This one to me looks like the little furry animal that came back there. That's pretty lovely. Uh, two years ago, I was in Latin America, I was in Brazil, I came second, just ahead of you. Brazilian Open and also the others. Look a little happier than in my uh, This picture was taken uh, I think one day during World Cup last year, which was the last competition, and then I crashed the next day. And so like me right now, um, talking about GAP. Why is it called GAP? What's GAP? Very good. It has nothing to do with the English word gap. It's actually the three guys who invented it, the three hang glider pilots, Jeremy, Fandler, and Paul. They sat down and said, We want to find out how to use cheap gas in competitions. You probably still remember how, before cheap gas, we used to run our competition with cameras, taking photos from certain angles, and uh, dropping cameras, having to wait for some of the score to develop the film, and everything was a big mess. Those three guys came up with a method to use GPS in our competitions instead. That's where the name gap comes from. They sat, literally, they sat down in a bar, like any great invention in the history of mankind. They sat in the three guys sit in the bar, start talking. They took a bunch of napkins and they started drawing curves. How should time points be distributed? How should this, all these curves, they drew them on napkins. And then they went to a mathematician and said, we need the formulas for these curves. And uh, mathematician then created the formulas. That's why some of them are a little wacky because yeah, they were bent on and then the math was made to fit those handbook curves. It started in basically 2000. 2000 they came out with the first version and 2000 we started flying, but seriously flying any competitions, but cheap, yes. And they kept developing and changing it to their needs. And there was a little branch off in Austria, Australia, uh, Austria, slightly different. And then basically every year, then the bike book also we modified it, we adopted it to make it fair, make it more transparent, maybe. Until, yeah, this stops in 2018, uh, it actually goes on. In 2021, we also when we look at how competitions are scored, there's a whole bunch of steps involved. I'm only going to look at two of them. The first and most important one, I think, is defining the competition parameters. So that's one that's not very well understood, kind of thing. Those who were at the team data briefing there for the first one. So the competition parameters are a way of saying what does it need here at this site where we are now for a task to be worth 1,000 points. We have five of those parameters we need to set. They're set at the beginning of the competition, they're not changed throughout the competition. First one is called the distance. We will go into how they affect the points that allow you to have just listed. In blue, you see the values we use in this competition here. So there's something called a nominal distance. And that's in the idea of the inventors, it's to say how far do we go here on a good day. So if it's different in La Reunion, then what's the cycle in Rolling? Where they put 200 kilometers to kilometer passes, Jalan. It's different. There's a different way to say, well, this is worth a thousand points. La Reunion, the 35 kilometer task is worth a thousand points. You have to work your butt off, shut off that stuff. Dominant goal is basically you want to say how many, how, how big is the part of the field that you want to go. Uh, 
of a hundred times participating. When are we happy? When do we think it's a good task? And when do we think it's more luck was involved? So if we say 30% out of 100, we expect 35 to go. If it's fewer than that, then maybe it was not a good task. It's the assumption. Maybe it was more luck was involved in probably one or two or three of them. Nominal time. How long should the task take? So the pilots have to take several decisions, have to really prove that they're good pilots uh, until they reach over, until they left. And nominal launch, that's a little different. That's more on the security side, the safety side. Sometimes everybody's on launch and conditions are such that only a few pilots launch. And the idea is, it would not be fair if those five pilots who launch fly and get a thousand points in the end and everybody who decided the conditions are too bad to launch gets zero. So, I'm going to launch means how many pilots need to launch for it to be worth a thousand points. And we set it here to 96%. And the last one is again safety. It's minimum distance. It's the distance that you get as soon as you launch, you're scored for that distance. Even if you bomb out right below launch, only 500 meters away, you still get that minimum distance. In this case, here, those five kilometers. And the way we defined it here was we looked at how far is it from Nabula to the landing behind uh, the golf course. It's four and a half kilometers. So you can safely land there if you bomb out. And you still get five kilometers more than you actually do. So no, no, no reason to risk your neck in those flying low or trees or power lines. That it was safe. That's safe. That's the idea. Also, keep in mind the people who invented this were hang glider pilots. For them, landing safely somewhere in an official landing is more. Yeah, it's a little more important than this. If you look at our results, on. It's, we will see it later, it's, in short, it's how long should winner take to get to goal. If it takes longer, it's okay, it's probably a hard day, but if it's shorter, then probably the task is too easy. That we need that. If you look at the result sheets that are published now for this competition, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a section with some uh, information that is really crucial. One of them is this one here, scoring. That's where you can see what is actually set. I mean, I told you that we set these, but maybe in some other competitions you don't know. And to know how is this actually being used, how this is being calculated, it's worthwhile scrolling to the bottom and seeing what is normal distance and what is normal to understand how the scoring is. Okay, that's about uh, competition parameters. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah, actually, no. yeah, the calculation is not as straightforward, unfortunately, they are drawing curves. Uh, but it is basically anything above is perfect. So let's look at it in detail. We skip all the steps in between where we find the task, we fly the task, we download the track logs. Next step is we calculate the task validity. How many points do we now today actually get? Some people call the task validity also day quality. And even throughout the documentation in the old days, both terms were used, but they're interchangeable. They mean the very same thing. So when you hear quality or validity, it's the same thing. I use validity. So the task validity actually, the full task, is made up of four different values. Each one of them has a value between one and uh, zero and one, and they're multiplied. So in the end, I get again a value between 0 and 1, or between 0 and 100 percent. It's launch validity, distance validity, time validity, and stop. In a task that's not stopped, stop validity is always stop. So that one is only effective in task like yesterday, where the meet director stops, that we get a stop validity that's longer than 1, it affects the validity. The other three we have every time. 
Now let's look at them. Non Trinity. What we put in, the input for that is nominal launch. Remember that's one of the parameters for the competition was nominal launch. We said that 96%. It's how many people are at launch. So the ones are sick or tired, or I don't know what, don't show up. They don't count in this. They're absent. But the ones who are at launch, they count. And then how many of them actually take off? And if we look at competition here, we have 150 pilots. So 96% of that means 144 pilots. If 144 or more launch, we have 100% for launch ability. If it's fewer, then we start evaluating that task because yeah, if more than six pilots did not launch, maybe something is wrong with the conditions and we shouldn't have counted it for. And as you can see, in the beginning it depends very little, it's very shallow, and then it goes down and then in the end it get almost nothing. So the fewer people launch, the more launch validity gets to break. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Second one is time validity. Again, what we put in there, um, for now just disregard everything in brackets there. So for time validity, we look at nominal time, the competition parameter, and at the best time, fastest piloting goal. We compare the two of them. We actually divide best time to one by nominal time. And if it's the same or more, if the best time is the same or more than the nominal time, we get one, we get full validity. So if the fastest pilot was faster than nominal time, it starts degrading. And if he's only there in 10% of nominal time, so here, what is it? Instead of 75 minutes, he's there in seven and a half minutes, then it's worth nothing. Makes sense. Probably the task was not set properly. If he reaches goal in seven and a half minutes, yeah, we can't. Now this is when somebody reaches goal, because we look at the fastest time, so we need somebody in goal. Now, as you know, there may be tasks every now and then where nobody reaches goal. What do we do then? We look at distance. So instead of normal time, we now look at the normal distance, also parameters. And we look at the best distance, how far did the furthest pilot get? And we do the very same thing. If you reach nominal distance, or if you go further than nominal distance, it's fully valid. If it's less, then we start devaluing along this curve. Only the best pilots. Only the best. This only takes the best pilot's results. So the fastest or the furthest. One. One the best. No, only the best, only the one that got first, and the one that was fastest. Okay. Okay. Twenty-eight or something. So it's twenty-eight divided by, or here we see it actually for task one. Uh, first go uh, Philip got thirty-eight point nine nine divided by fifty. So. Uh, plus one, the time validity was 0.78. So the general if you've got the very best pilot, and if you're trying to say that in the whole system, then we don't want to be really recording the lucky pilot who gets away, but we do want to be recording uh, the general movement of the pilots in the three. Mm -hmm. be better to actually Can I stop you there? If we go into wouldn't it be better discussions here, we will never end. Oh, okay. I would like to tell you how it is right now because it's not my invention, by the way. So I ask you the question? Yeah, then maybe we do it like for the afterwards. Why did not you say the top five pilots? I don't know. Just ask Gerald and the other two. Okay. So that's time with it. All clear still? Yeah. Okay. Uh, distance with it. That's the interesting one. Here we take a lot of it. We take nominal goal. Remember, that's the percentage. We said 30 percent. We take nominal distance. We take minimum distance. We take again the best distance, the pilot who flew furthest, 
added to the rest of the little off here. But we take the sum of all flow distance, so we add all the flow distances up and divide them by the number of pilots, so we get an average flow distance. How far did the average pilot fly in this class? And to show you how that looks, try to down here. So what I do here in this graph is I show you the average distance of the pilot's flow. And I want the validity is the distance validity. And like right now I give you two examples. Uh, one is with the nominal distance of 50 kilometers and one is with the nominal distance of 100 kilometers. And we also assume the best pilot flew exactly 50 kilometers. And what we see here now is with the nominal distance of 50 kilometers, unfortunately this is too small to read, but down here it says 30, 31. So we reach full validity at 31 kilometers. So if the average pilot in a race flies 31 kilometers, that's for the numbers here. If the average of the field flies 31 kilometers, we have full validity for distance. Does that make sense? It, that's unfortunately not, it's the average pilot. It's the average of all pilots. It's the average flow distance. Now we can play with those numbers, as you see, but if I use normal distance 100, it's actually the average field. The whole field, the average has to be 60 to get out to our Does anybody want to see some other values for normal distance or best distance? So you get the feeling how this, how this interacts. All this, the whole 60%. Rule of thumb, yeah, that's what I, I kind of use, yeah, as a rule of thumb, it's about 60%. So when we look at competitions, I see that sometimes, we have a support for some competitions, and they set all the distance to 30 kilometers. And we have, like, at 18 kilometers average, you get 100%. And if that's at the side, we normally keep it like 80 kilometers, it's a problem. So in general, what I find, having worked with FS and having supported in many competitions, this is the value, the nominal distance value is the one that's usually set wrong, usually to two dozen. And that means tasks that should not be worth a thousand points are then suddenly worth a thousand points because we reach that very quickly. Islands reach 60% of that very quickly. Yeah. No, no, that is not a point. Set it to a good triangle, except that mediocre downwind tasks still get a thousand points. It's probably Chris, you know? They're all valued the same, so there's no way. All the three, they are the same. So, distance validity, time validity, uh, launch validity, and also stop validity, they're all the same, worth the same. <coughs> Correct. No. Yeah. Exactly. Because only then will it actually devalue the weekdays, the bad days. So you get lower points for you. Yeah, not some good things. That's the idea, the philosophy. In this case, the 
other distances between two points, both in the time of the if nobody reaches goal, very correct and very well known. That's uh, yeah, that's one of the interesting things about this. So uh, the thing, it makes more sense with the magnetic the average, the average, yeah. Um, so. Why not use it? <laughs> Can I stop you there? Yeah. So what is for instance the average distance from these two times? Uh it was I have not calculated it. But yeah, so I mean that's something you don't know. Remember, you need to set this up front, exactly. and you won't know what the average is. So what I recommend uh, meet directors to do is because they have to set normal distance up front. Is think about a good thing, not the exceptionally really fabulous day you get every ten years. The good days in the year. How far can you go from this side? And they told me, for instance, here it's about sixty kilometers. So I personally would set normal distance for here from Loma Bola to 60 kilometers. Accepting that we have a world championship where maybe we never get to a thousand point stars. But if we do, then at least those good days are valued accordingly and the, all the others are in relation to that. So I use what is, a, what, what is possible on a good day as a okay. All good? No. No. Find the whole day. We only find maybe one, five, two, three hours. Uh, so, sorry, I meant not cross country flying, yeah. really. But what, what do you fly in comps on a good day on this side? And yeah, maybe. Yeah, then maybe we could even go up to 80. 60 was what they told me on a good day. Exceptional day is 80, but good day 60, so I would set it to 60. We're now at 50, we're not that far away. It's okay. Well, and it's down. Yeah, because this is what you said. You can also have the value of 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 the when they're actually setting up the parameters, it's a popular consideration of where are we going to the average pilot going to get. Yeah, that's something I don't think you can actually gauge. Okay, yeah. It's not a capabilities but it's always a gap. So, are we going to the distance for All clear? So, in task one, this stability was 0.812. On average, people got pretty far along. I mean, we say they need 30% for 100 or 1. So, yeah, we got, I think the average was like 26, 24. The last one is stop. Now, remember, on a task that runs through, this is 1. We don't even look at it, it's just 1. Once the task is stopped, we start calculating. And this is a, something that's a little newer than the rest. This was actually invented by Woodrick, the scorekeeper here. It was invented after 2009 World Cup Super Final, the first World Cup Super Final. Who was there? There was one task there that was stopped, you probably remember. It was stopped at the time and the whole field was still in the same thermal. Everybody turning in the same thermal. And at that time, because we didn't have stop validity, it was stopped. And it made a significant difference in points whether you were on the side of the thermal facing towards goal or on the opposite side. A significant difference. And of course, it couldn't be changed in the competition, but those results, a lot of people were not, especially that half of the field that was on the side of the side of the thermal, they were not really happy with that. So Ulrich sat down.
<laughs> okay. So Boring invented the stop validity and it takes into account how many people actually already at the end of speed search. Or, let, let, let me phrase this differently. I mean, this is all that goes in, but his thinking is two things. One is how far is the task already done? How far is it already assigned? And he looks at how many people are still flying and how many people are already on the ground. If a lot of people are still flying, the task is not very decided yet. It's still all over. If everybody's already on the ground and two or three people are still flying, we can make the validity very high because basically it's decided. He also looks at how far are the pilots spread along the course line. If everybody's followed up, then the task is not decided yet, so the validity is low. Stop validity is low. If everybody's already lined up, like in that one stopped task in Muncie, was it 2013, 12? It was stopped. Everybody was lined up with like differences of 500 meters between pilots. It counted fully because there is no way somebody would pass somebody on the way to go. So, depending on how bunched up or spread out, stop validity goes up with that. And so what happened yesterday is when it was stopped, there was still a huge group all balled up up there on the ridge. And that's why I stopped with it yesterday. It was only 0.332. So on top of not flying very far, our distance validity is low. And because nobody made goal, our time validity turned into the second distance validity, which was also reduced because nobody got to the thing longer. And launch with it, it was okay, everybody launched. On top of that, we don't have one third to stop the lift. So, if everybody had landed right there where they were when the task was stopped, we would have, instead of 130, we would have three times that. We would have like 400. Meters. But because of the stop, it was devalued by this. Does that make sense? <laughs> You mean the, the bonus distance? Yeah. Yeah. Bonus yeah. Uh, not in the stop validity. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good no, it does not. We only look at where people work, and then we add the others. As the most significant. All right. So that was stop validity. So we covered all the four validity factors. We know how to calculate day validity. Well, I know. Do you know too? Are we good? Okay. Now, I don't know how to do this in my head. So to answer Daniel's question in the beginning, when I started working on FS, I started playing this game where after every task, I tried to make an estimate how many points we would get for that task. And I was frustratingly off every single time. So a couple of years ago, I stopped playing that game with myself, which is frustrating. And, um, apparently there is uh, Jamie says Johnny Duran Jr. is really good at estimating. He lands and he calls it right away every single time. But he's probably the only person I have ever heard of who understands or has a feel for it. In a feel more of you. He doesn't calculate. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you now understand the mechanisms, but turning that into an actual figure after you land, knowing how you flew, maybe knowing how others flew, it's really difficult. House and I need a computer. Okay. So also at the bottom of every rank, you find this. That's the answer to the bias task two yesterday only worth 139 points. So the distance validity was 0.53, time validity 0.771, stop validity 332. Launch is one, so we multiply these four numbers, we arrive at this. Does that make sense? So, whenever you have a good 
question or wonder about it, how scores come to be scrolled to the bottom. Very easy. So basically, there is password one that is not It's correct. Yeah. Yeah. The percentage would be so yeah, this, this percentage it is 13.9 percent, so it's here on point three nine. They then that's the next step. They turn into points. Now we have to figure out how many points do we hand them, because we have different categories of points to hand them. Yeah, we need to figure out how. We do. And currently, this is how it's done in Gap. Now here we fly according to the WC formula, so it's slightly different. The wrong slide in here. I apologize. So what you see here right now, that would be gone. But here we fly with PWC, which means the red bar is smaller in the beginning and then gets wider here. Uh, it's not uniform. It's not it's but that's a different thing. That's, that's, a, that's a different thing. Different. That's just how many points do we hand up? The big takeaway here is what's on the bottom here, that's pilots in gold. So depending on how many pilots make it in gold, our distribution of points, how many time points and how many distance points, that changes. The more pilots come into gold, the less important is uh, distance, but the more important is time. So I may be the winner. 10% come into goal, and then if, if all the rest comes in eventually, also suddenly that switches. You also find that at the bottom, I didn't copy it from one of ours, that's an output test, but also again, you find the available points for those categories for distance, time, distance, time, and leading, you find those always at the bottom of the solution. Still makes sense? Yeah. So, so just to clarify, the available points are also It's very Correct. So that's the big difference right now between GAP and PWC. In GAP, it's constant. We made it constant throughout. The idea was that it doesn't matter how many pilots make it into goal if you did the uh, lead out work, you should be. Uh, your bonus should be the same, or your points should be the same. In Australia, we actually have to fix data. Yeah, that's probably going to fix that. Okay. Six to five, this is six to five. Yeah. Yeah, so the dating points, similar to the time points, they grow as more. As more pilots make it into gold, they start to look less than what we have here. And they grow to the size. Correct. Okay. Shall we move on? Okay. So now we know how many points we distribute time points, distance points, and leading points. And now it's time to give them out to pilots. So pilot score is made up of their distance points, time points, and leading points. Uh, distance points are the easiest. They're linear, starting at minimum distance. So here, 10 kilometers. So if, as soon as you launch, no matter how far you get, you get at least 10 kilometers, and then it just goes up linear. The further you get, the more points you get. Very easy. No curve. Time points. They're a little more different, a little more difficult to calculate. So I give you three examples here. They're based on best pilot's time, the best time, and your time. So if the best time was one hour, if you got the blue line, two hours spread, three, three hours, best time. And there are basically two main takeaways out of this. Takeaway one is the curves are steeper in the beginning than they are at the back. What does that mean? Exactly. So a one second lead between the first and second will translate into a bigger point difference 
and the one second distance back here. So if you beat the other guy by one second and you win the race, you're up here, it will be behind you more points than if you beat your buddy who gets 80 and you get 70. You understand that? Okay. The second takeaway is they hit zero. All of them eventually they come down to zero. So there is a time behind the leader where if you even if you make it to goal, you will get zero time points. Which means that's what I usually tell the beginner, you're, you're a different category, you will race to the end. But beginner pilots, if you're way behind, stop racing and make it to goal safely. Because then you maximize your distance points. You won't get any time points anyway, so don't race yourself in the ground. Take your time because yeah, if you're yeah, if the winner had one hour, you're at two hours or more, you won't get any time points anyway. So don't hurry too much. Of course here for championship definitely. But they hit zero. Okay. The last one is the leading points. Actually, at least numbers are split and same on the left. Yeah, it's winner's time times square root of winner's time. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't make that up. It's, yeah, it's probably a nice, nice purpose. So, leading points. Leading points are virtually completely wrongly named. Remember, the people who invented the cup, they were hand gliding pilots. Now, in hand gliding races, most of the time, they use races with multiple start gates. That's their normal form. So, unlike us who all race together, they try to separate the field, so they declare four, five, six separate start gates, separated by 10, 15 minutes. You can choose which one to take in that race. We can do the same, it's not very common in our races. Well, maybe five or six last year. Now, when they came out with Cup in the beginning, and uh, the first few races were scored with it, they got really annoyed with pilots, because all the pilots were hanging back, waiting for others to play the rabbit, so they could catch them, because if you have pilots in front of you, of course you're fast. So nobody would take the first start gate, nobody would take the second start gate, and so on, and then the day was over and everybody managed it. <laughs> so they came up with about three or four different ways to encourage people to stay, take the first start gate. And the one that actually stayed in place for the longest is called leading points. It should really be called, please take the first start gate. <laughs> What they don't do is reward the guy that's crying in front of the gag. That's our perception when we hear leading points is, oh, I fly 50 meters in front of the others and I get a lot of leading points. Do it for his disappointment. So how do we calculate leading points? We look at your progress over the course line. So this is here, our uh, speed section 62 kilometers and we have four pilots who make their progress towards goal or not. But the green one, he lands here. And from then on, we just assume the birds to come all the way up until the last pilot lands. Orange had a GPS malfunction in between, so we again, we assume the birds, we didn't make any progress until we had enough. No one was in the lead at first. He also started very early. And then the black one started later, and at one point, past the blue one, it was in front of all the rest of the world. We draw this for every one of you, this progress curve. And then for every one of you, we look at the area underneath this curve. So we cut it out and lay them over each other. And we look which area is the smallest, because that means that's the pilot who made progress the fastest. 
And again, keep this small function or landing. That adds a lot of area. So you lose out. You get fewer and fewer, and maybe not even any. With me so far? That also tells you why you should uh, set your Mario to record at one second intervals, right? Because if you have longer intervals, you get a zigzag like this for every, between every point. Yeah. Uh, the life tracker is supposed to record still internally every second, and then when we download that one, it scores you for that. But in the old days, I mean, yeah, we could still set our values to record every 10 seconds or every 5 or every 1. So that's, I think, was really cool. So, when this guy who thinks, well, leading is about leading, it's about having the others just behind me, but I'm up front. Unfortunately, with this whole calculation here, his line will be exactly the same, almost exactly the same as the ones following in 15 years from now. When we call calculated all in the points, the difference is so small you won't need to So if you want to make a difference with leading points against the others, you're willing to we really have to weigh up. That's, that's Does that make sense? How far is it by It changes every time, but so one, two, three, five. You also have to maintain that for quite a while. And that brings us to something where I realize now I really didn't bring the right presentation. So, on top. Yeah. Well, you start out with a bigger area on this side, but if you beat them all by a lot, you can still make it up. If you just catch up, you won't. Yeah, you will be behind. You will have lower lead points. Exactly. That's what you see. That's what we know, right? People who are way behind, they caught up with the leaders, but stayed with the leaders. They, they're, they're the ones who will fall back in the end because of low lead. Yeah, so that's just how, in general, leading points work. Originally, it was evenly distributed over the whole course line. So it didn't matter where and when you made good progress, it all counted the same. And unfortunately, I don't have the graph of that. But eventually, the PwC and then we got followed suit. It was decided to change that and make it more worthwhile at the beginning. So that's when we, the scenario I describes is even worse. So in the beginning, leading points were worth way more and then fell down. I have to try to this. They fell down. I haven't felt that yet. In, in what category do you need to subtract? It was a quadratic. It was a quadratic. <laughs> so in the beginning, it counted really a lot. And then the further you progress, the less these count. The problem with that was start gadgets got really aggressive because your first client was really, really crucial because anything you could get out of that one counted double, triple, quadruple. Anything you made in terms of leading later on. So, a little later on, the PWC changed that two years ago, and again, Gallup followed suit. And I apologize for not having that graph. But now, to change the big chain, how it is here now, the first 20% of the speed section, leading points basically don't count anything. And then they start growing, going up. Distance of the speed section. Yeah, sorry. The first 20% they count almost nothing and then they go up all the way and start falling down again. Which means if I mess up in the beginning, if I mess up at the start, it's not so bad. Because yeah, I have a bigger area, but at that point it doesn't count that much. But after about 20% of the task, that's really when the leading points start hitting in. That's where the group that's out front, they start bringing up. 
then it falls down again. So the last few kilometers of the speed section, uh, leading points are not that important anymore. There it's more about who gets there first. You understand that? People go and just wave my hands. No, that's fixed. That's just based on the. It's for every task, and it's based on the speed section. Yes. Yeah, it's always the same. It's the same curve. That one does not adjust when you. And I will try to yeah, show a picture. Maybe I'll put it on. I put it on the, the chat how that picture actually is. I can do that. Of course. If you want to torture yourself, yes. <laughs> okay, so this is. I'm sorry. So, can I yeah. Pretty much, yeah. That's. I mean, there are round yeah. curves, so you can't say black and white. This is where it starts out, but this is really where it starts getting yeah. important. It's not a bell curve. So, uh, yeah, Ulrich, yeah. well, we that's something more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's curve. Cool. Okay. You do it, and then somebody yeah. else came up. <laughs> Correct, yeah. So, or is it like uh, zoom and square to the distance? To my knowledge, no. But now we're getting into an area where I don't know everything because the documentation for that is a little sketchy. <laughs> And if you look at your results, I mean, that's something I don't really have to tell you. That's how it's, re uh, how it's presented in the end. We get the distance points, leading points, time points, and of course your score is the sum of them. This is produced by a test, but when it's done with correct software and object, it's pretty much the same. You're familiar. Then we rank the pilots. That's the easiest task. Oh, wow. Yep. That's this here. That's this here. So basically, how much of the overall is awarded to leading points? It depends on which formula you use, unfortunately. But in Gap, it does not change anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. That would be kicked out. That was a That would be kicked out. So, to come to a conclusion, uh, ranking is forced by the sum of your points. Yeah, so we rank the one that most points is first, and so on, that's the trigger. And then we create the competition rank. That's where FTV comes in. Who still has brain capacity to take in FTV? Good. So, what does FTV stand for? Fixed total validity. Yeah, which is three words, one out from the other, which don't really make sense. So, it's just a collection of three words that I think are pretty random. I couldn't really figure out why it's called So it's this card system for results with different top scores. In the old days in the World Cup, every task was worth a thousand points. There was no devaluation. Every task was worth a thousand points. And they could use a much easier discard system. So just the lower your points, the worse your task can out. Now because we got, as we learn, we have different top scores. Sometimes the winner has a hundred. 39 points, sometimes the winner is 77 too. We need a different system, that's what that we need. It allows also to discard partial results. That's what makes it a little complicated, but also mathematically fair. To give you an example, we have a competition with four tasks, and these are the validities, so yeah, 
Last one, somebody got 1,000 points, last two, 800, 500, 1,000. If I add all those up, I get the total validity, that's probably the title, it's probably of 3.3. My scores are written on the mean, so my score, if I don't do any discards, is 2,000 data we do. First thing I do is I figure out how well did I do in relation to the task validity. So how many points, how, how big is the percentage of my points in regards to the validity? Uh, so there are like 98.585%. Then I sort them according to that percentage. So the one with 100%, that's a win. Oh, it's worth 500, I want 500, so I, I, I want that task. It's 100%. On the bar end, there's an 800 task, the 800 point task, and I only had 600 points, 82.5%. I sort them in that order. Now, it is exactly what we say FTB is 25%, that's what we have here. Total validity, we said, is 3.3. 25% is 0.825. That's how much I discard. Out of those 3.3, 0.825 I throw out. Worst. I start with the worst pass, the one with the lowest percentage, whatever that was passed to. It was valid with 0.8, and I have a total of 0.85 to discard, so I can discard the full one, and it counts nothing anymore. I still have a little bit left to discard, because I have. 0.825 to this part of the wall, this one was 0.8. It's still a tiny little bit to this part. So I move out to the next one. And of this one, I can discard because it was fully valid. 0 0.5, 0 0.025 is 0.5%. It's 21 points I discard. So the last task comes nothing. This one, out of the 850, I still count 828. And then I'm done. I've used up all my discards, so the following task is not fully. And that gives me an FTB 25% result of 2,228. If we look at results, again, this is FS, we see for every task the validity. That gives us an idea of yeah, how good the best ones, how many points they get. And then we see for every task what was discarded and what was partially discarded. There's no number in front. I would like to give you another example and then we're done here. But that's because every now and then people ask, in this example you just gave, you keep the 500 points you keep the 500 points task and you cross out the 600. That's stupid. You should take that one out, not that one. That's not how it goes. So let's look at that with a sample with three pilots. So we got five tasks, four of them count fully, and the last one was only half. We have pilot Alex who won all the first, first tasks and then only had 100 points on the last one. So his total score is 4,100. We have Boris and Charlie, they're twins. They always fly wing to wing, exactly the same. And they came in with 900 points for the first two tasks and both win with equal time, with equal many points and everything. They win the second, the last task. So they also have 4,000 points. Now we say we do FTV. And because the math works a little easier, let's do FTV 20%. So one fifth, the first one fifth goes out. Who wins? Okay. Now, there's one thing. Charlie is, I said they're twins, but Charlie's Boris is evil. <laughs> so he already knows, yeah, FTV and. They will probably cross out my 500, no, and they will make me keep my 500 points. Uh, they will win and they will start crossing out, labeling on my 900 point. I think. So he goes to the scorekeeper, 
pays him at least one glass of beer, probably more, and asks for him to change the rule of finance activity to make sure that he crosses out the five hundred. Now let's look at how that develops. We do, like I said before, we write out the percentages first. So it's fair for Alex, it's 100% for all the first four, and then 20% for the last. And 99, 90 for them, and 100 at the end. Total penalty is 4.5, and we discard 20% of that, so 0.9 we throw back. If we look at Alex, we start with this first task, that was the last one, very obviously, and we kick that out fully. We still have 0.4 to discard. So we move to the next one, we discard 40% of that, and we're down to zero. We don't have anything left to this company. Everything else counts fully, he has 3,600. Understood? Okay. Now, Boris, we good. We do the same thing, and it doesn't matter which one we do, because they all have the same percentage, so we just can't pass it. It's 0.9. But we need to discard, this one counts fully, so we discard 90%. 810 points we throw out. We keep 9. And then we're already done because we don't have anything, any discard left. So all the others count fully, and this score is 3,290. Those who keep score already know the number. But now, what about Charlie? He bribed the scorekeeper. This card first is task quick because it's its lowest score. So we do that. We start with 500 points. We discard those. Because it's only 0.5, we still have to continue this card. So we have to move up to the next one. And from that one, we also have to discard 400 percent 360 points. So we cross out the 500, but we also cross out 360 and 100. So, in the end, the score is 3,404, which means Charlie loses out. He paid the beer and he got the Does that make sense? It's probably not to digest, but I'll send it out if you can go through it again. If you have questions, usually at launch, sometimes around here. Look at it some more. That's basically how I think. That's what we have. Why are we as a stopping class for time? Stopping this Oh, that's just how it is represented. I, I think that's on a, uh, an FS, it shows what time it was announced and then what time it's scored for. Uh, I think. No. It, it depends on which one you look at. I think one of them was. Yeah, that was yeah. 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 The calculation there is okay. Um, how much is it? Is according to that, yeah. how much is it in chance of one person is going to call your rest? So, basically, the best, thing, the best thing to do is show here. So, oh shit, I hard coded it somewhere in this formula here. Sorry. So, I can't tell you off the top of my head, unfortunately. I can make it. It does, yeah. Because uh, I have to look at the formula some more. I can send you this also so you can play yourself. But I'll add a normal goal as the parameter here so you can play with it and you see how that shifts. How that changes. I think that's a good tool for me director to figure out what should I actually use as a as normal distance. At moment. But in general, we have been using 
pretty solidly for 10, 15, 20 years now. Nobody has really moved a lot there. And so I wouldn't even change that. It is so it's true, yeah. It's, it's more important how far the average of the field flies than whether or not uh, people reach that percentage of people reach goal. Also, one thing to remember if more than the 30% reach goal, that doesn't give out to anything, then it's just okay, then we're just at the maximum. But all everybody underneath then develops it. But it's not one to one, so it's not if only 29 of 100 reach goal, then we start devaluing because it goes more into the, uh, the average distance calculation. Um, at the time, it was a choose to just the guy. Now we're not that bad. Then. Uh, they, they just said we want to give something, but depending on wind and everything, you can't really take too much. So it's better than nothing. The, really, the idea came out of we had a task in Hosi that the Europeans were. People were at the, on the ground, and others were 2,000 meters above them. And they were scored exactly the same. So we said, exactly the same is probably wrong. And so we just took the 4 to 1 glide and said, yeah, let's add that. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. It's more. So therefore, it's. Hang gliders have 5, so they're not much better. <laughs> probably it's more important. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. You get something. With, Forward over that one, it's quite underneath. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> depends on which formula. We have all of them in there somewhere. Sometimes it's from long, sometimes it's from start, sometimes it's from start to goal, sometimes it's from start to end of speed section. So it all, some very those formula, all, all possible variations show up. Well, their FTV and the competition parameters are pretty independent. Yeah. 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 I would send it for the, let's say, lesser side. And then accept that the others, probably even the mediocre task and the better value will count for. Okay. More questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> and happy flying! See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank